we all know about continental drift, or more specifically, uh, plate tectonics, right? So continental drift was the precursor to the common theory or the, the, the present day modern theory of plate tectonics. And it's not that continental drift was wrong, it was just incomplete. So continental drift was first proposed around 1912. It wasn't accepted completely until the 40s or 50s. Uh, so fairly recently, uh, until people sort of realized that or, or came to actually believe this, uh, not doubt it. And this is the idea that at one time, all of the continents were one supercontinent called uh, Pangaea, and then over time they began to move, right? So they begin to separate apart, and you know this is the time of the, the Jurassic period, of course, the time of the dinosaurs, and the fossil records uh, even you know support this theory. So in in areas where the plates used to be near each other or connected, uh, the fossil records um, uh, convey information that supports that. Sixty-five million years ago, the end of the dinosaurs, and then present day. And so, again, um, the, the missing piece was why the plates moved. Right? And so it, it's not that people thought they floated around on the ocean or on the water, but we weren't sure why they moved. And that wasn't really apparent until the 1950s, 60s. And why do you think, what, what, what else happened in terms of science advancements in the 50s and 60s? Major science advancements in the 1950s and 60s. Space travel, right? I don't know about space travel, but, but uh, we, we uh, I guess, you know, we went to space in the 60s. Uh, but specifically, we, we've had space programs. We launched satellites by the 60s, numerous satellites that began to take pictures of the Earth. And we realized that the Earth, the continents, uh, of course, it wasn't just like some, we just instant had this epiphany. There was evidence before. We certainly had earthquakes and other things. But we began to understand that these continents or the Earth itself is not made up of a single thing, but rather multiple tectonic plates. Okay. And so this is a picture of all of the, the tectonic plates. And the tectonic plates are continuously being regenerated through essentially volcanic activity, right? Most of that occurs in the ocean, um, oceans. <laughs> and they're continuously being subducted or you know, moving underneath one another to the extent that some of them are, di are disappearing. Um, and it, uh, like for example, in this picture, it may be hard to see from, from the screen, but there's a plate here, the Juan de Foca plate, which is right there. It's actually bordering on Washington State and Oregon, and it's actually subducting under the North American plate, and in another 50 million years or so, it'll be completely gone. And so, of course, like I said, we're not mo we're not losing any mass mm -hmm. um, through this subduction. What happens then? Uh, gives us a story about, or gives us a way to describe the different types of plate boundaries we have. Right? So um, uh, the, I guess the easiest one to start with is uh, what we call um, divergent plate boundaries. And they're divergent plate boundaries because uh, perhaps we should use red here to indicate magnum. Right? So we're continuously generating new material from the mantle. It's being pushed up through the crust, generating new mass. Most of this occurs in the oceans. And at the same time, that forces the existing plates to the side, right? away, from, away from the volcanic activity. Therefore, we call this divergent. Right? Divergence means things move away. So we have a divergent plate boundary. Things are moving away from where new mass is being generated. <coughs> uh, convergent plate boundaries are then just the opposite. So this occurs where one, where the two plates meet, and one plate uh, is subducted under the other. It's al this almost again because 
Convergent, because new material is mostly generated in the oceans, it's mostly the ocean plates that move under the continental plates. Why do you think that is? You what? They're denser and they're thinner. And of course, denser means obviously heavier in one respect, that it allows you know, the heavier thing wants to move underneath the lighter thing. Uh, but the fact that they're thin also matters because if they're thin, they have a lower flexural rigidity. Right? So do you guys remember in, in uh, strength of materials, you're talking about structural rigidity, like if you have a beam, if you have a beam, it has a structural rigidity that is EI, right? E times, you know, E is the Young's modulus, I is the moment of inertia of the beam. Remember doing those calculations? Right? So the, the, the I, the moment of inertia of the beam, is a function of the thickness of the beam. Right? So if you, if you idealize one of these plates as a, one of the, the, the plates as a beam, the fact that it's thin mean, means it would have a lower flexural rigidity and it's more likely to flex or bend. And so that allows it to accommodate this motion of subducting uh, under the continental plates. So it's almost always the ocean plates moving under, subducting uh, under the continental plates, and these are called convergent plate boundaries. Okay. So uh, then the other one is called a transform plate boundary, and this is a result of the fact that, again, if we have if we have a divergent plate boundary. So if we imagine like taking a slice of this plate right here, um, if I'm if I have divergence, I'm I'm pushing on you know I, this is applying forces to this side of the plate. Over here I have subduction, and where that's moving under, I have a lot of friction, right? So friction is a force that always resists motion, right? So if this plate is being pushed that way and moving moving that way underneath the continental plate, there's a force moving in the opposite direction. There's a force being applied in the opposite direction that's due to friction. Right? So those two forces are squeezing this plate, squeezing it from the boundaries, causing stress. That's the tectonic stress that we care about when we want to do calculations in the Earth. But of course, the real Earth uh, is not as sort of nice and, and rectangular as I've drawn this. Right? The plate boundaries are very irregular. <coughs> and that irregularity causes an irregularity in forces applied to any given plate. And those irregularities in forces will cause shear. So in other words, if I just take something and I just squeeze it on all sides, I'm not, you know, I'm not, sh shear is a, so the shear is a distortional, um, when I say shear, I'm talking about a, a distortional motion. So in other words, if I take a block like that and I shear it, shear it, I'm distorting the shape, something like that. But it, it turns out that the, there's no volume change. Associated with a pure shear, there's no volume change. So even though my, my picture's not drawn correctly, uh, if you were to measure the, the area of the volume of that guy and the area of the volume of that guy under pure shear, they would be the same. Right? So there's no volume change associated with shear. So this volume, the, the word that we use, the sort of analogous word to shear when you're talking about volume change, is uh, often you call a dilatation. So dilatation would be, a pure, a pure dilatation would be one in which there's volume change, but no distortion. So my, my, my square is still square. I've just changed its, its area in, in my two-dimensional drawing, volume and three-dimensional drawing. So uh, if I have a very idealized plate, like, so going back to this example, if I have a very idealized plate like that, and it's just applying normal forces to the sides, I'm only dilating it. I'm only applying a dil dilatation to it, and I wouldn't change its shape in any way. But, but again, the real Earth is very irregular plate boundaries, very irregular distributions of forces due to friction and other things. 
which causes shear or ch shape change, and rocks do not accommodate shear motion very well. Right? We'll, we'll talk specifically uh, about that later in the sense that they don't, uh, a rock will fail under, shear, under a significant amount of shear. And so as we're shearing the rock due to these ir uh, irregularities, then we actually get failure due to shear. And then the plates begin to slide past one another. And this is what we call a transform plate battle. These also mostly occur in the oceans. However, there is one significant transform plate boundary on our western border. What is it called? The San Andreas Fault. So the San Andreas Fault is mostly um, a transform plate boundary. And the reason I say mostly is because no fault anywhere in the earth is 100% any of these. Right? They almost, and, well, I guess there'd never be a, <laughs> a case where they're both convergent and divergent. But, but in most cases, they're almost always convergent and with some shear, so some transform, or possibly divergent with some shear. But they're almost always some combination 